Thank you, Chief Morris. Thank you, Chiefs. Welcome. Welcome back from lunch. I trust it was healthy and nutritious. And uh, I'm going to struggle to keep everybody's focus after we had such a, such a great lunch. But I think we've got a really fun topic to talk about, even though I only get to talk about it at an unclassified level. But talking about national defense strategy that was set forth from the Secretary of Defense uh, last year. And it's ultimately changed the paradigm of how we in intelligence take a look at our problem sets and how we can solve these problem sets and it gives us a little bit of a structure now if you've seen previous briefings that attack what we do on a global scale maybe you've heard the uh, the intel equation of four plus one well now we're in a two plus three concept and i'm going to uh, explain that here very shortly because as we see within the national defense strategy and i do want to take a poll of people of who has actually read the national defense strategy very good response i i hope everybody takes the time over over uh, the next few uh, weeks and months to please go over that document because it really does outline how the paradigm has shifted and particularly over the past uh, 20 years of conflict as we've seen as we have evolved from really fighting against an asymmetric uh, warfare fight and against rogue nations and really seeing a reemergence of great power competition rising up against us trying to evolve within a post-World War II order and maintaining that as the great powers are really trying to pull apart our NATO alliances and greater alliances that we use that are very pivotal to how we are able to execute our day-to-day -day operations and our global operations as it is a truly global fight. Where are my partner nation represent representatives here today? So, great. Thank you so much for everything of what you do that really helps us bring strategic power to, you know, to the globe and everything that you do as, as we work together. So, so we see, once again, it's the two plus three concept now as we talk about our great power competitors of China and Russia, and then we'll also delve in, uh, in more uh, detail on the DPRK, Iran, and as well as violent extremism. So let's take a look at the map and we see the physical area that these competitors take place. But really, it's when we talk about how cyber works in and through these capabilities and uh, as violent extremism perpetuates throughout the whole planet, really, they're not constrained anymore to borders. Really, as far as influence and trying to propagate uh, technologies and capabilities, it really is a global threat environment as we go through the multiple regions and functions uh, and working through the different domains. And we've already talked about uh, multi-domain uh, command and control and how cyber capabilities enables all of that. That's really what we're talking about. So when we look at adversary goals, we'll start off with China and how they're really trying to pursue a national rejuvenation. And they're going through Really, in the same way that we talk about the American dream, well, Xi Jinping has established what he calls his Chinese dream. And uh, China is actually getting ready to celebrate the first of two 100-year anniversaries. The first of which, which will take place in 2021, is the 100th anniversary of Communist Party rule within China. And now the centenary goal for that was for China to be able to be an economic power that doubles its GDP uh, over from 2010, and they've already been able to do that three years ahead of their goal. Their second goal, as of 2049, that will be the 100th anniversary of the People's Republic of China, and they want to be the preeminent power supplanting us within, within the world. And they look to do this in multiple different ways. Maybe you've heard of the Belt and Road Initiative, where it's a way for, uh, for China to not only be the regional hegemon and, and control uh, finances and all sorts of logistics within the Pan-Asian region, but also building capabilities that will link real, really global commerce and be able to control when uh, controlling global commerce at that level, ultimately it's going to have uh, an effect on the battle space as well. When we talk about Russia, 
we talk about a nation that went through a bit of an identity crisis coming out of uh, coming out of the 90s and through the 90s once the Soviet Union fell and trying to reestablish itself uh, as a as a global power and we see them ultimately trying to to flex their muscles and and corner the market as far as their uh, their weapons development and, and proliferation and using that to help spur on an, uh, an economy that had been struggling which is now starting to uh, to be able to regenerate itself and they're trying to assert themselves a little bit more globally and we'll take a little bit more of a look at that in North Korea now we get into these rogue regimes and a lot of what uh, they're trying to do in Korea is really legitimizing that particular regime and instead of having the world looking at Kim Jong-un as a despot last week what was he able to do he was able to get the world to look at him in the summit basically on par with the the world's top leaders and that's really what North Korea is trying to do with all the flexing their muscle with their nuclear capability and their military capability is really showing that you know it's an information campaign to their own people to to show their own might and that they actually have a seat at the big boy table with uh, with the rest of the main world powers Iran trying to extend their particular influence and we see this in multiple areas within the Middle East with their with their influence in Yemen as well as in Iraq and in Syria um, talking about materiel and fighters and uh, other capabilities that perpetuate their ability to grasp onto that uh, key terrain as well as violent extremist organizations so when we're talking about both ISIS and Al Qaeda and they kind of have a couple of separate different goals so when we talk about Al Qaeda trying to destabilize nation state authority that we've been trying to build up over the past couple of decades in Afghanistan as well as trying to ISIS trying to reestablish the caliphate that the combined joint task force operational inherent resolve has been able to decline over the past three years so we'll, let's take a deeper look at China and what they've been able to uh, to ultimately accomplish on the nuclear side they are rapidly modernizing their nuclear capabilities and rapidly modernizing their force all the while trying to maintain that they are a non first use entity uh, the, the numbers are somewhere between 260 to 280 uh, actual warheads that they have which really makes them the the second smallest of the top five nuclear powers as far as how many active warheads they have within their arsenal but they are uh, they are still very active in not only uh, producing warheads but also delivery mechanisms for that aim uh, doing uh, intercontinental ballistic missile tests uh, as well and that goes straight into the space discussion because uh, space capabilities and ICBM capabilities sort of go hand in hand and also focusing on um, satellite communications robust ISR capabilities once again getting into that command and control discussion China's trying to develop much stronger capabilities in that realm as well as they try to control and influence the battle space to uh, to their effects within uh, within space as well they're getting a very growing customer base for space lift uh, in the pan-asian region and further uh, we see a lot of smaller nations that are just getting into the space realm that are building small satellite packages that are looking to other countries to be able to uh, lift their capabilities up into space and China's taken the forefront in uh, in allowing them to use their rockets to be able to put their capabilities up in space and they're and they're looking to be a leader with that well the more robust that space lift capability is it can it's immediately applicable to what they're doing with a uh, ballistic missile development as well and uh, China is uh, actually very key on the fact that they are very much against what they would call American weaponization of space uh, and trying to get Russia in on uh, its capability to say we're going to deter the US at every step of trying to weaponize space well it's mostly also to move people away from looking at their own anti-satellite capability and and they see 
they see that as more protecting themselves against American weaponization vice developing their own space-based weapons. Uh, within the cyber realm, China is very well developed. And think about it this way. China is actually the largest English-speaking country on the planet. So what capability does that give a country like China? Well, they have lots of capability that they have, that they have developed uh, through cyber reach uh, to be able to reach into American networks. And we, uh, we see this as we've got fifth generation uh, cyber development uh, through the company Huawei. And we already know that you know, the United States, Japan, Australia, to name a few, uh, no longer use any type of, of Huawei capability for their government networks. But that's also something that, you know, potentially other partner nations could be using uh, uh, that type of capability. And uh, in China, uh, obviously with the closed off nature of their regime, uh, it's actually in their laws uh, that force the handover of data from any company if it has any type of a military application. So we keep that in mind when, uh, when we talk about 5G and data. And that goes straight into the air and air defense uh, portion of the chart because a lot of the, the knowledge and capability of catching up to like fourth and fifth generation uh, fighter development and weapon development within China uh, largely has happened through, through cyber means of, of stolen intellectual property that China's been able to perpetuate. Now, the struggle that China is going to have moving forward, ultimately getting to that fifth generation goal, is really being able to develop their own capability that, that they can own and cultivate and, uh, and be able to advance, uh, as well as adding advanced munitions to those air-to-air -air capabilities, whether we're talking um, hypersonic capability is something that they're, they're fast developing, as well as unmanned aerial vehicles, and, uh, which is really key for uh, throughout the region. Uh, for them to build, build their ca uh, capability. And um, their fourth generation fighters, actually, um, uh, they just recently had an air show where the J-16 has come online. And talking about, once again, we, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, small sat capability within the Pan-Asian region. Well, there are also uh, air forces within the Pan-Asian region and beyond that are looking to expand their particular capability and China's trying to grow their ability in the market to be able to bring other air forces up to speed with Chinese capabilities. And we take a look at Russia. Many of us know that Russia has the, the largest nuclear stockpile and now not to be uh, encumbered by the INF Treaty, which was just torn asunder just a few weeks ago. So now President Putin, um, in early February, after, uh, after uh, President Trump backed out of INF Treaty, um, which is the uh, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, now President Putin has said that, well, we're going to redevelop those Intermediate Range Nuclear capabilities that were previously banned under the INF Treaty. Um, as well as modernizing all the delivery systems to that uh, very robust capability that they have. So about 4,500 strategic weapons, um, uh, both, uh, both strategic and non-strategic weapons that they have uh, within their stockpile. Very robust space capability. Once again, they're, they're trying to recover their economy and, uh, and ultimately and ultimately bringing that, that space capability, a lot of people still don't realize they're the ones who are actually taking our astronauts up into space. So they can use that capability as sort of diplomatic leverage against us uh, if, should we actually uh, increase uh, sanctions on, on them. Also very rapidly developing anti-satellite capabilities in concert with, uh, with China to deter U.S. freedom of action within space. Very, uh, very sophisticated cyber and electronic warfare uh, capabilities. A lot of, uh, a lot of what our strategic uh, competitors would, uh, would use. They, a lot of them use Russian equipment. And we've seen them use a lot of this capability as they've infiltrated uh, into Ukraine and Syria and also into uh, Georgia with those conflicts that, uh, uh, that they've been able to um, to use as a basically a first uh, 
an initial into the conflict uh, type of a capability. But within, within air and air defense, we see them using, uh, especially in Syria, this has been their proving ground for all of their capability. We see a lot of, of testing and development and operational um, actually using new weapons, new capabilities, um, whether it's new radar systems, whether it's new uh, aircraft capabilities, um, uh, integrated, uh, integrated missile defense. Uh, once again, this is a country that's very highly uh, reliant on their surface-to-air missile capability, um, but getting really good with their TTPs and passing those on to their uh, Syrian counterparts and doing a lot of great lessons learned for their uh, command and control capabilities. Now we're going to get into our rogue regimes a little bit, starting with North Korea. And uh, the summit, uh, as I just mentioned before, just... Uh, just wrapped up last week. There was no deal that was struck. And some of you may have actually read some of the headlines from today that one of the missile production facilities up in North Korea is back up and running. So what's not clear is if it was already running prior to the summit or if, if this is a result of no deal actually being brokered between uh, North Korea and the U.S. in the lifting of sanctions onto North Korea. But ultimately, how did we get to this point? Uh, a very large uh, ramp up of capability, especially when we look back into 2016, 2017 of North Korea's fielding of uh, intercontinental ballistic missile capability. And we actually saw their first two tests that went off without failure with systems that have the ability to range the continental U.S. So still very committed, despite still trying to win the court of global public opinion of how, of how the, the U.S. needs to, to lift sanctions on, on them. As soon as uh, Kim Jong-un was able to declare himself a nuclear state, that was ultimately his ticket to, to the, the seat of saying, I am a legitimate uh, nuclear power. Now let's, let's bring this to the table and, and start talking negotiations. Naturally, um, we, we are looking for a lot more. So no launches in 2018, but also looking to use that capability within a space sense and, and looking to actually use those, uh, use the development of an, of an emerging space capability to uh, continue their ballistic missile aims. Uh, within the cyber realm, not as developed as China or Russia, but, sh but still showing uh, quite an aptitude for that, as well as um, most of the, their attacks or most of the focus is south of the border into South Korea, some targeted attacks, um, mostly using uh, ransomware and, and those types of uh, abilities to extort money uh, for them, uh, obviously for, for them to be able to gain um, more access to materials. And in air and air defense, we take a look at North Korea. That we say that they have a lot of antiquated capability when we look at their aircraft or their missile defense systems, but the regimented uh, ability for them to be able to exercise and be able to use this capability, they are really competent and really good at using a lot of this older capability. So we look past the fact that they're using outdated equipment. They're very proficient at using outdated equipment um, and once again relying on a lot of surface to air missiles and in AAA that they have in mass uh, in order to be able to counter uh, any threat. And then moving on to the other rogue state, Iran, and another deal that uh, ultimately fell by the wayside in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which, uh, or as many of you know, is the Iran nuclear deal. And when that fell, basically that, uh, that removed any guidelines that kept uh, Iran from the ability to be able to develop um, a nuclear weapon within a year for their stockpiles. So uh, previously under JCPOA, it would, it would take them five years or more to, uh, with, um, with the amount of centrifuges that they had on hand as well as the, the amount of highly enriched uranium that they had in order for them to be able to build a weapon. Now, without those, without those chains on them uh, provided by JCPOA, they have the ability 
to be able, or with they have enough highly enriched uranium, they could conceivably have um, a one-year uh, out timeline from developing a nuclear weapon. A uh, very minimal space presence, but we did see them conduct a launch, an unsuccessful launch last month. But they are broadly exploring that uh, capability in order to, once again, uh, cross over that ballistic missile capability and, and space capability. Um, they share a lot of technology with North Korea. Um, so once again, uh, invested in each other in order to be able to develop capabilities. And trying to evolve their cyber capabilities. Then we've seen a couple of different instances where where Iran has perpetrated uh, very key uh, facilities and key capabilities um, like Saudi Aramco uh, back in 2012 as well as back in 2017. Uh, in 2012, uh, a, focused, um, a focused hack from the, uh, the Revolutionary Guard Corps uh, actually knocked out 30,000 computers and stopped uh, production from Saudi Aramco. So it's a very, um, a very considerable capability. Um, as well as um, they had a, an attack on a New York dam facility back in 2012. A very similar uh, attack against uh, uh, a security controlled and data acquisition system that can control a large uh, capability that has both um, uh, military and civilian uh, capabilities to that. So surface-to-surface uh, -surface missile uh, dependent and are working very hard to um, further develop that capability despite, uh, despite sanctions, investing really heavily in unmanned aerial vehicles, and we're seeing a lot of that capability, um, especially down in, in Yemen um, with, uh, with those, uh, types of, uh, those types of capabilities being used. And, and talking just like in North Korea, some outdated, outdated systems, but looking to uh, update their capabilities, but once again, very proficient with the outdated systems that they have and very reliant upon uh, other rogue states to help bring them up in their capability. Now we talk about violent extremism and we think about the, the ISIS problem. Uh, imagine uh, the ISIS caliphate, what you see in that map uh, up there, the gray area is what the ISIS caliphate was at its largest strength about four years ago. And now that red dot at around the Atomf garrison there in the tri-border region is really the last real stronghold of what we would call ISIS's physical caliphate. But imagine that caliphate and dealing with it like squeezing a water balloon. So the, the harder you squeeze it, you're going to get water coming through your fingers and it's going to ultimately perpetrate in all different directions and you know, and all over. And that's ultimately what we've seen with the caliphate. As the physical caliphate is gone, we see a lot more mo uh, mobilization if you look at the map down below it, uh, and a lot more ability through decentralized execution, decentralized leadership, than be able to perpetrate lone wolf attacks and other coordinated attacks using that capability. So being able to eradicate ISIS, I, I, it, it's sometimes seen as a misnomer, well, we've won the war against ISIS. No, we haven't. Really, the war has just begun as far as what we're doing against these violent extremist uh, organizations. Um, looking on the Al-Qaeda side, I talked a little bit about how they're really trying to legitimate or legitimize their role in what's going on in Afghanistan as uh, the government is trying to build its capability and, be, and become a lot more legitimate, uh, trying to tear apart the, the internationally recognized government there and establish one that's more favorable to their aims. Um, and per, perpetrating all sorts of recruitment bases, and we see this going through, uh, there's a big push to be able to recruit into sub-Saharan Africa, and, and it's a major uh, area because now they're going into areas that are not predominantly Muslim, but yet are able to exploit an area that is uh, generally uh, generally repressed and uh, sowing you know sowing all sorts of seeds for uh, for chaos and destruction there in in places that are not traditionally Muslim. So ultimately, what uh, what I want 
what I want everybody to be able to take away from this discussion is ultimately the way the national defense strategy has, has shown our fight has really evolved over, over the last 20 years. And where we didn't necessarily worry about great powers, those great powers are catching up to us very rapidly. But if we devote all of our attention to those great powers, once again, we're losing sight on a lot of those asymmetric capabilities. So this is once again why we bring in a whole coalition uh, of, of help and wealth and experience that we rely upon every single day and we appreciate everything of what you guys do. So here's a very quick picture of what we're looking at with our intelligence challenge and I'll take any questions that you have this time. And we have the post-lunch lull, I see. But once again, ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate your attention. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Chiefs. And uh, have a great conference. Thank you. All right. Look at that time. Where was that this morning, huh? Sorry, I didn't mean to say that out loud. Just kidding. All right. I think we are all set. Um, got one slide to come up real quick for this afternoon. Just want to kind of show you guys the uh, uh, location for the elective electives.